My name is Amanda Schomburg, and I'm a speech language pathologist, and I am currently practicing in Texas. I have been working since 2009, and before I was a speech pathologist, I actually was a social worker for Child Protective Services. Um, so I worked with families who are going through a lot of, you know, trauma and abuse and neglect situations, which really has been super beneficial to my career as a speech pathologist working in schools because I have an understanding of the dynamics that families go through from you know, being a social worker. But most of my career has been in the schools. I truly love working in schools. It's where my heart is. Um, I've worked in almost every setting, a medical setting, clinics, early intervention, but I just seem to always come back to the schools. And right now I have a private practice where I contract to schools. I have um, three major contracts with the school districts in my area. How long have you been doing contract work? I'm on my third year. Um, I opened up my private practice in June 2021. So this is my third year and it, my practice keeps growing and growing. Um, there's just such a shortage of speech therapists in our area. So my company is filling the gaps for those districts, which is really cool. And another thing is a lot of districts won't hire speech therapists part time, like one or two days a week. But my company, I do that. And so I send people who maybe you know, a lot of my um, therapists had babies or have families where they want to stay home most of the time, but they would like to work one or two days and I give them that opportunity, which is really cool. That's awesome. And yeah, definitely shortages all over. So I'm sure that going into private practice has been probably a really positive experience for you. There's no shortage of work and people looking for speech therapists. Yes, yes. And I have a small um, private patient caseload. Since there's such a need for school contracts, I've kind of put the private patient side on hold for now. If we ever got an influx of speech therapists where I wasn't needed, then I'd probably focus more on private practice. Are we using the term speech language pathologist and speech therapist kind of interchangeably? Do you have a preference on which one we use? No, it's it's interchanging. Um, so a speech therapist can also be a speech therapy assistant. I know in y'all's world, I don't think you guys have like assistants because it's either your no, yeah you sadly have, not yeah. I wish <laughs> so a speech therapy assistant they are a bachelor level um, professional and they do therapy only they can't test they can't like hold IEP meetings interpret tests none of that we also call SLPAs or the assistant speech therapist and then speech language pathologists can go by either too so. Speech language pathologist is kind of an, it's a longer term, but it really, like if you're a master's level professional, that's what you are. Does that make sense? Yeah. And in your guys' world, like, do you call each other SLPs or do you just say, oh, the speech therapist? Like, how, how do you typically refer to each other? We would call SLPA or SLP. So okay. uh, just for short, because it's such a long thing to say. <laughs> it, is. it is. Yeah. I wish psychologists had a quick way to do it, but I'll probably be saying SLP, but so for listeners, everyone probably knows this, but SLP, speech language pathologist. And yes. how would you describe what a speech language pathologist is? So we're a professional that specializes in communication. A lot of people will hear like speech pathologists or speech therapists and think of articulation, like a child who can't say there are sounds or even maybe stuttering. Those are things that I guess the general public really kind of just think about when you, they hear the term. However, we have such a broader scope of practice. We work with, you know, kids to adults. Um, we work with like language delays or disorders. So expressive language, the child's or adult's ability to express their thoughts, needs, wants, um, their ability to understand and process language. We also work with adults with cognitive rehab after like a stroke or some kind of traumatic brain injury. We work with dysphagia, which is swallowing. So sometimes, you know, due to medical reasons, people are unsafe to swallow. They may aspirate. And so that is um, another area that speech therapists treat. Um, so it's super wide <laughs> of a scope. Um, we also work with like kids with phonological processing disorders. It is really kind of crazy how much we really do. There's a specialty track of speech therapists that work mainly on voice disorders. So, I mean... It really, it's one of those things that um, once you get into this field, you can do so many things. And if you get bored or you don't like one setting, you can always change to a different one. When you go to grad school to become an SLP, like, is it just one program that allows you to work in all those different settings? Or do you have to have like different levels of education to do all of those different things? Well, it's kind of um, depends on where you're going. The school I went to, they trained us in all areas and you have to do five clinical placements. And the idea behind that is that you will do a semester in each of the different settings. 
Now, you know, sometimes there's a shortage of like hospital or medical placements. In my experience, I got to do every single one, which was really nice. Now, you know, some of the sub uh, categories of like medical, like I didn't get to do a, an ICU placement, which I think would have been fabulous, but I did do a hospital and a rehab. Um, now, there are specialty speech therapy graduate schools that train for medical, and then there's also some that are some that are more educationally based. So it just really depends. If you're interested in this field, you would need to research the grad school to see what kind of training they provide. That's really interesting because you can work in so many different areas. Yeah, there were times I was working in the schools and then I would pick up extra work at nursing homes after school hours just to make more wow. money. But yeah, so so I really like doing that because I got to keep up both sides of my skills. I haven't worked with adults in a while. So there's also a thing, and I'm sure it could apply to psychology, but there's a scope of practice. Mm -hmm. There's a scope of competence. Mm -hmm. So like, let's say I wanted to switch fields and go into medical. Well, I haven't done medical in so long. I would not feel competent. So I would need to do some on the job training, um, maybe go to some workshops and do stuff like that to get up to that competency level to treat like swallowing disorders or, you know, right. cognitive post-stroke rehab, stuff like that. Um, so that's something that's also very important in our field. We may be trained to do everything, but we may not be competent in everything. I love that. I have not heard it expressed that way before, but that's such a good way to phrase things and think about it. It's like, yes, your scope of practice, but morals, ethics, like what is your scope right. of competency? What is the area that you're trained in? And always probably the same for SLPs, continuing to get more training kind of like yeah. throughout your career. It's a practice that like continues to evolve. And so you always have to keep learning, I'm assuming. Oh, absolutely. I mean, even in my, you know, I have, I've been in the field since 2009. So I mean, I guess that is a long time now. <laughs> I always forget that I'm over 40 now. It's, it's weird. And I my kids are in high school, and I have one kid in college. It's just crazy. But even the field has changed, like things I was taught in graduate school is really not okay now. Like there are, there have been those kind of changes, especially with like the neurodivergent advocacy and stuff like that. And the social skills training um, that I was taught in graduate school, you know, adults with autism have said that some of that ha was not helpful for them or even harmful. So it's really changed the way I think about it. And so just stuff like that, you got to keep up with the latest research, but also hear from people who went through the therapies that you're providing. I think that is right. so powerful to hear from adults who were in therapy when they were a child or even, you know, hear from parents as well. So I, I think there's so many pieces to look at when it comes to continuing your training training and your knowledge base. Yeah. And I think that speaks to the pros and cons of being a new practitioner or in grad school is like one of the pros is you're learning all the newest things, all the latest research, all the best practices that's like at the forefront of your mind when you're going into your work. But then the cons are you don't have the experience quite yet. And like you haven't heard from all these different people about what they think about things like you're going in just with the theory and what you're being right. told is best. But that on the job training is really helpful as well. There's pros and cons to both sides there. What state are you currently in? I'm in Texas. Okay. And have you always been an SLP in Texas? Yep. I'm originally from Montana, but I moved to Texas in my mid childhood. So I'm not truly a Texan, but I've lived here for the bulk of my life. Oh my gosh. I haven't been to Texas. I've heard great things, but I've also heard Montana is beautiful. Well, okay. Let me tell you, like Western Montana is kind of like plains, but um, mm. I mean, East, Eastern Montana is plains, but I'm from the mountain side. And I was born in this little tiny mountain town called Whitefish. It's on the mouth of Glacier National Park. It's like literally the most majestic place on earth. I did yeah. go to Alaska and, and see the glaciers and the mountains there. And that's the only other place that I felt that same, you know, feeling when I'm home in the mountains in Montana, I get to actually go back in two weeks. I can't wait. Um, <sighs> it's just such, I mean, I feel home. And now I live in like the plains of Texas. Yeah, it's, a little different. <laughs> it's flat. There's no mountains. Yeah. There's nothing. It's, yeah. I'm jealous. I have never been to Montana either, but we just moved to Utah and Montana was mm -hmm. one of the places on our list as well, but it's a little bit remote for not having like family or anyone out there, but it looks yes. gorgeous. And I'm sure yes. Yellowstone has not helped with the show with the pricing <laughs> out there in Montana and everyone moving there. So you're lucky like you're from there. You still have family there. It sounds like. Yes, my mom is one of 10 and they're mostly all up in um, that area. So Beautiful. I have a ton of, ton of fame. Well, the reason I asked about where you are and if you've lived other places is to know if you've 
seen differences in SLPs kind of across the country, but we haven't talked about this. You have a social media account that you've been running for a while, Panda Speech. Maybe through that, you've seen like differences across states and SLPs in the way they practice. Yeah. So I do IEP trainings all over. And so what I found is that's super challenging because I'm so used to Texas education agency guidelines when, you know, doing IEPs and writing IEPs, but each state has little different guidelines. So if I go to another state, I do have to research and find out the differences because there are like, you know, timelines for evaluations or timelines to get, you know, response from parents and stuff like that. There are a little bit of difference. Now, as far as our treatment and the way we would approach therapy, typically that's going to be the same. Um, of course, each person has their own unique approach. I wouldn't say there was much you know, difference in that part of it. That makes sense. I should have clarified, I guess, more in terms of like the special education piece. I find at least working in the schools, there's a lot of differences amongst states and practitioners. And going back to like grad school where you're told, depending on the state, you're getting trained in like, this is the way we do things. This is the law. And it's not until later that you realize, oh, that was like for my specific state or even like my district that I'm working in. So that comes up for you too. Oh, absolutely. And the other crazy thing is I work for three school districts right now. There are little differences even between districts within (laughs) Texas. I'm like, what? Yeah. You know, it should be uniform one state, but no, each district can have certain policy as long as they're following, you know, like the legal guidelines. Yeah. Which is crazy because If as the professionals who like live and breathe this every day, we find it hard to juggle and like confusing these poor parents who like move across counties, across states, military families, like it must be very frustrating when this process can already be a little bit frustrating for them sometimes. I can't imagine kind of being on the other side if you have to switch places. Yeah, you know, sometimes when I get IEPs from out of state, I'm just like, okay, hold on, (laughs) figure out what I'm looking at here. (laughs) Yeah, you've been in this field for a long time. And how long have you been running Panda Speech? Kind of unofficially since 2014. Back then, the surge of speech therapy apps in the app store became this huge thing. And I had some friends who were app developers. So I started this blog where I was reviewing these apps and it got pretty popular. I was sending out app lists and recommendations. And then um, I had always been creative and making my own things to do in th- you know, graduate school. And then when I got my first job and one of my friends was like, have you ever heard of this site, Teachers Pay Teachers? You should try to sell your what you make there. And I'd never heard of it. And I tried it and it just kind of blew up. And now I have multiple storefronts. I'm a children's book author. I do all this stuff, but I really, it's, uh, it's kind of crazy how it all just kind of exploded to the point where I could quit my full-time job with all the benefits and replace it, the income with, you know, my different ventures. <laughs> That's amazing. And you do awesome stuff. Your stuff is educational and really entertaining. I recently saw your book. I haven't bought it yet, but I, when I was kind of looking at some of your stuff for our interview, I like took a deeper dive into your book and I was like, that looks so cool. Like I want to get that for my son. Tell us about your books. So I've been selling lift a flat books with interactive pieces for years, but they were print and make books. So people had to print it in color, cut out the pages, laminate it, put Velcro on. So it's kind of annoying, but once you get it done, it lasts forever. Well, people would come up to me at conventions and just say, I wish you had this already made in a book. And I've been hearing that for probably six years. So I finally just did it. And it took me a while to find a manufacturer who would get, because it has little Velcro interactive pieces to complete sentence strips in the book and with liftable flaps. Every book manufacturer kind of, they were like, well, we can do the flaps, but what's, what's this Velcro stuff, you know? I finally found one and I got some prototypes made. And I mean, they're just so amazing. So basically they're lift a flat books, but they ask yes or no questions. They build um, your sentence length. They encourage early literacy and independent reading. And they're all like really great topics for pre-K age kids. I have a bug theme one where the child is looking for a grasshopper. So you're looking around the park to find, and you find all the other bugs, like a butterfly, a spider, and all those kind of things. I have a food theme one. My next theme, I haven't officially announced it, but I've kind of hinted at it, but it's a farm theme. And you all know, like pre-K kids and farms or even little kids, like two and three year olds. It's like, I don't know why, but parents are, we're always talking about what a cow says, what a pig says, like with our littles. Um, It's just such a popular theme. So that's going to be my next one. And it's, it's so cute. I cannot wait. I'm so excited. I think it's so cool. You're mixing 
obviously like communication and language building and literacy, but you're also building in play. And so kids are right. not just like reading a book, which they love to do, but they're really engaged with it because they're getting to move those Velcro pieces and search for things. It looks yes. really cool. My yes. kid is only six months old, but I still want to <laughs> do it with him. <laughs> It'll still be fun for him to watch me. He'll probably just try to eat the pieces. <laughs> Yes, I I have a disclaimer on there, like choking hazard, don't let like littles, you know, be alone yeah. <laughs> with the pieces. But I have a little a little grand girl. She's my actually my sister's granddaughter, but I help raise my sister kids. So I claim her as my grand girl. I'm BG bonus grandma. It's a whole thing. <laughs> um, she comes over and she's two. And she she she'll do the books with me. She loves it. I but I would say the target age for like kind of safety reasons would be like three and up. But as long as you're supervising while the child's reading it, you can use it with any right. age. To go back a little bit to SLPs. Can you tell me broadly speaking, what the education requirements are? Like, how would you become one? So you have to get a bachelor's degree in communication disorders. And if you have a bachelor's in something else, you can do leveling classes to get to where you need to be. And then you have to go to grad school. And the grad program is usually two and a half to three years long. There are some programs that do it a little quicker. Like I think two years is like the quickest program you can find. And then during that grad school experience, you have to do five different clinicals. And that can vary between programs. And then after you graduate, you have to do clinical fellowship year where you're supervised. And that's nine months or like 1200 and something hours. So then, um, you know, you obviously have to take a big board test. It's called the Praxis for Speech Language Pathology. You have to pass that. So there's a lot of little steps in there, but I will tell you it's very worth it. I'm sure like in your programs. My best friend is actually a school psychologist. I'm so not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We work really closely together. I I put on my Instagram story earlier this week, like, what questions do you have for SLPs? Like, I'm interviewing one on the podcast later, and I got so many messages being like, I can't wait because my best friend's an SLP, and I hear that all the time, so... It yeah. makes sense. You know, even though they're very different areas, there's a lot of similarities in our career, not only in like the training, but in the experiences. We're often kind of isolated in our job or like one right. of the only SLPs or psychologists in the building. And then, you know, we've made a reel about this, but we work together often on different assessment areas, right. like evaluation areas. Yeah. And I think um, having another professional, like even the diagnostician, they understand the testing piece because our tests are very similar. Um, when we're testing expressive and receptive language, you guys also test in those areas for your cognitive tests. And then we all, I love when my, um, my friend would come to me and she would, we would be testing the same child and she would say, let me see the language scores, you know, and, and we would just talk about it and how things are impacting each other. It, it was just very interesting. And I learned a lot about, you know, the, the school psychology side from working with her. Like I know all the terms. So it's in um, our IEP meeting when the school psychologists are reporting, I'm like, well, I know everything she's talking right. about. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's re it's a really cool experience to have another practitioner in the building who understands a little bit more closely than the other staff members or, you know, people you're working with. So we do often find yes. each other and get to bond a bit more. Well, this, you know, ceilings and basils, nobody understands that like a tester, you know, oh, like, yeah. when, that, when that kid gets we're almost to the ceiling and then they get one more right and then they, you know, get four yes. wrong and then one right. Yes. And you're like trying to, depending on the setting you work in too, but like I was working in high school most recently and it's very fast paced and you're like, okay, the bell's going to ring. You're going to go to your next yeah. class. Like we're almost done. Can you please just, I want you to get them right. But also you're almost meeting the ceiling there. So let's just cut it. Come on. Yes. <laughs> get to yes. Your, yeah. Speaking of, I guess, since we're talking about school psychs and SLPs working together, is there anything that you think would be helpful for school psychs to know when working with SLPs? Are there any kind of maybe pet peeves or common misunderstandings that come up when we're working together? I wouldn't say pet peeves because I worked with a school psychologist that just like, she got me, I got her. And we, we just kind of, I mean, she was the only one I've really worked that closely with. I, I work with some now but it's random school psychs assigned to the testing centers, you know, because we have like a uh, testing teams that come in for one of my districts. So it could be, I've worked with Which so many. Which is different. It, there really is a big difference when you have a relationship with the people you're right. working with versus just coming in and out. Like I feel like pet peeves could come up there a lot easier. 
I think like with some school psychologists, just remembering that speech pathologists are super trained in language and a lot of their testing has a lot of those language components. And just to rely on the SLP some, you know, especially if you're both doing testing. I've been in meetings where the school psych has really explained the communication. I mean, I guess it's okay for them to do that because they did test that part, but it's like, just refer to us because that's our area. You know, does that make sense? I don't want to sound petty, but... Oh. No, that totally makes sense because we do have like verbal comprehension and some of our tests ask parents sometimes about like expressive language and receptive language. Obviously, that is not our area of expertise or training. Like, yes, we have a little bit of training, like you referred to earlier from the cognitive portion, that verbal comprehension. Right. And like from working with kids all the time, we kind of can tell, oh, something seems a little bit off. But I completely agree with you with referring to the SLP because that is not the area that we were really trained in. And that is the area that you went to school for and were trained in. And yes. so especially if you're there and you're involved or you're right. evaluating, like why not refer to you and be like, I'll let Amanda, you know, speak to this part since that's what her testing was about. You know, and I've looked at y'all's testing for the, you know, the verbal um, expression or comprehension and our testing just goes so much deeper and breaks it down like more thoroughly. And so that's something that me and my friend used to discuss all the time, how, you know, sh her, she might have had this score, but when I did the full testing with the full language um, battery, it looked a little different because it broke down maybe some more grammar, syntax, you know, um, all those different areas that um, maybe weren't picked up in the broad one. Does that make sense? It completely makes sense. And it Reminds me a little bit of a parallel situation outside of SLPs and psychs is um, special education teachers and psychs. So some of our tests, kind of like we're talking about with our relationship, some of our tests are similar, kind of looking at um, dyslexia, which I know you guys can do as well. We'll talk about that in a bit. But like the KTA is a academic achievement test, and it right. looks at phonological processing sometimes. And so sometimes I do see that over interpretation maybe of an academic mm -hmm. achievement test being like, oh, this means they do or don't have a phonological processing deficit. And it's like, well, our tests as psychologists go a little bit deeper and look in a little bit more nuanced way. Um, right. And I think that that goes then with like your communication piece. It's like, yeah, we might be looking at communication, but in a different way than right. your assessments are. So I respect that completely. And I, I understand that. And I could see how if you don't have the best relationship with your psych and SLP or the best like working relationship that sometimes psychologists maybe could overstep that line because we're used to kind of being a little bit more of the person maybe running the meeting or right. interpreting most of the results. So I think it's important for us to remember when we're working with SLPs to give you that same level of respect for your training as well. Yeah, you know, it's weird. And this is a big issue in the school speech therapy world. Many school speech therapists feel like they don't get as much respect as like a school psychologist. A lot of speech therapists are actually paid on a teacher scale instead of like a professional scale. It's a bad problem. I've actually spoke, I was a keynote speaker in Oklahoma, which is one of the states that has this problem really bad. And I just talk about self-advocating for yourself in the workplace and not letting a job take advantage of you and stuff like that. We want to be as respected and held on the same level as you guys because we are, you know, similar. I mean, we all have our unique training and our unique abilities, but I just don't know why speech therapists sometimes just get the bad rap in schools. I, I just can't understand. Yeah, that's interesting. Like to be completely blunt about it and transparent, I think school psychs feel that way in general too. Like a lot of people don't understand mm the level of our training, the depth of our training, and we wish that they did. I think right. that because psychologist is a term that like is widely known, people yeah. already have like an idea of what the psychologist is. And we're so involved in 99% of those evaluations, maybe not 99%, but a huge part that people just and we're usually the ones kind of running it that maybe that's why partly that happens. But the other thing is, I think that people know even less about speech therapists or SLPs. They might not know much about school psychologists, but they hear the term psychologist. So then they right. have this like preconceived notion where SLPs, people don't realize, I think it sounds like we have similar training for our areas, but you have even bigger reach 
and you work in even more settings and across more of a lifespan than we do. And I think there should be some additional respect that goes with that as well. Like you're trained professionals. We are too. Yeah. You don't just work in the schools though. You work in hospital settings. You work in clinical right. settings. Like you work with babies, you work with adults in rehab. I think that probably some more education needs to go into all educators for understanding like all the different staff members that work at a school. I agree with that. Yes. Well, you know, what's crazy when um, we hired my friend who, well, you know, in Texas, they just changed from LSSP license for, for a school psychologist professional or whatever it was. Now they're, they changed their title to finally school psychologist. And they're so excited. She like called me and she's like, guess what? You know, because in I don't know why in Texas they were called something different, but they have been for years. And anyways, when we hired her, we had a diag opening, a diagnostician. So, you know, the person who tests for like specific learning disability and stuff like that. Well, they hired her and I was like, well, how are we hiring her? She's a school psychologist. We need a diag. I had no idea a school psychologist can do all of the same testing, all of the same job functions as a diag, plus, of course, all the psychological services. It blew my mind. So see, even right. me, who who I worked in schools for a while, didn't even know how much yeah. you guys did in the school. And vice versa. I mean, I'm sure already and through the rest of our conversation, I'm going to learn so much about SLPs and hopefully so will our listeners. I think because we work closely together with other staff members, like even teachers, they work with us, special education teachers, OTs, PTs, like there's so many different people. We're all working together in the school, you feel like, oh yeah, I know what they do because I work with them. But really, we none of us truly understand the level of training and like really comprehensively our, our jobs and what we can do and what we're trained to do. Unless you do something like this, where you talk to someone or you go and do your own research. But we're all short on time. We're all trying to research our yeah. areas. So it makes sense that unless we're trained in grad school about really what these other staff members can do, we don't understand each other well. And I think that's a disservice to our job as well. And we like step on each other's toes sometimes, even if we get along and we don't feel like as fulfilled in our jobs when you don't feel like other people truly value and understand everything you can do. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy in my job, like one minute I may be helping a kid who can't say they're ours, but the next minute I may be going into a medically fragile classroom and helping a child communicate with an alternative communication device. And then I may be going helping a child with, you know, vocabulary, or I had a case like this, but they were a little kid. We also do feeding therapy. So I have a, I have a new case of a child in one of my schools who has um, a feeding plan. So I had to go train the staff on how this child can eat safely at school, which I mean, who would think a speech therapist does that, you know? Yeah. There is such a vast amount of speech therapists doing other things. Like, you know, I have a friend, she specializes in voice. She does work with anybody with any kind of voice trauma or voice disorder, but she also works with singers, but she's a speech pathologist. She helps wow. singers come up with safe, you know, ways to use their voice and how to, you know, prepare their voice for their singing performances. So, I mean, that's so unique. And that's a wonderful thing to know too, if anyone listening is interested in becoming an SLP, like it sounds like you're never going to be bored. You have so many opportunities that will last you an entire lifetime <laughs> to switch into different careers still under the umbrella of SLP. Absolutely. And another er area that I think, you know, if I was ever to change, you know, what I was doing, I really like what I'm doing. I don't see myself doing anything else, but working with babies and moms and, and a lactation consultants working on the team for that, because there are some babies who have difficulty swallowing and, you know, the muscles of their mouth and they're having difficulty with lactation. And so I actually went down a rabbit hole of going into what, you know, the t comparing the two jobs, a lactation specialist and a mm -hmm. speech pathologist. And I'm like, wow, this is so similar. Um, and so that would be something I think would be really cool to work with newborns and new moms. But I don't think, I think I'm getting too old to switch now. I mean, naturally never say that because you're never too old to, <laughs> to do something different. But yeah. I just... I have so much going on in my life, but I think that if I did anything else, I would do that. Yeah. And I had a lactation consultant as well who she told me that she worked closely with a speech language pathologist. And so it was again, I was like, oh my gosh, like another thing where you think because you work with this other professional, like you understand their job, but really you only see such a tiny, tiny piece of it, especially in the school setting when right. everything is happening really so fast and you're the main part you're just seeing is when they're explaining the results and saying if a kid is eligible or not like right. that's such a tiny part of everything 
we all do. Right. What made you want to work in the school setting as opposed to like all these other settings? I really just liked the school model. So in the schools, we we try to figure out a, a plan or an IEP to help best support the child to be successful in school. So you know, whatever their issues are, we try to figure out a way to help them access the curriculum, participate in the classroom. So that's the end goal. For a child to qualify in the schools, they have to, number one, have a a communication or speech impairment. Um, Number two, there has to be a need for specialized services from a, um, a speech language pathologist. And number three, there has to be a direct educational impact. So whatever their speech impairment is directly impacting their ability to, you know, complete assignments, speaking, you know, all those things I said, the medical model, medical, sorry, the medical (laughs) model, (laughs) um, it qualifies children a little differently. It's really based on activities of daily living, their quality of life. So even a mild speech disorder can have an impact on your quality of life. So a child with a mild speech disorder who may not It may not be interfering with their academics. They could qualify in an outside clinic. So there's a little bit of difference. I actually had to make a handout for parents because I would get so many parents saying, oh, they qualified at so-and-so clinic. Why aren't they qualifying here? You know, they'd be kind of upset. So I started giving this handout at every evaluation um, meeting or IEP. So (laughs) that's actually a great idea that that's another similarity in our work that that happens. The difference between private services and private identification or diagnoses and working in the school setting and special education and identification. I think the difference in psychologists is that usually we are not working in both settings mo- most often some psychology school psychologists do also have private practice um mm-hmm. but be, you know being a clinical psychologist versus a school psychologist are two different careers right. where for your job as a SLP you actually privately do diagnose and do treat right. those things um and so this is a question i have and i thought i maybe saw this come up in working with different slps was that some slps would qualify students or say like yes we do work on that or i can work on that oh we don't typically do this but i can where others would be like no we don't do that in the school setting and so i wonder if that's because mm-hmm. of that training and work that you do both privately and in schools and just kind of some SLPs maybe just choosing to work on something at school where others well, maybe just are like, well, no, you know, this is the hard line. We don't do that here. I see that a lot with dyslexia services. Um, some speech therapists are very trained in dyslexia and actually work with dyslexia like at school in private practice. And then there's some that say, absolutely not. That's a reading specialist or dyslex- dyslexia specialist job. So I have seen that in from my colleagues. I personally, um, I know dyslexia is, you know, a language-based disorder. However, I don't feel competent because I haven't been trained in it. So I personally do not treat dyslexia. But most of the districts I work at have specialized staff for that anyways. I would say if I ever was working in a place that did not have support for that, I may go get training or I may go do some job shadowing or, you know, do some workshops if it was a need. I It is very, I mean, there's so much overlap um, that I think it, it would be something that'd be worth it. But I just never ran into the, you know, the case where I've had to, had to do it. But yeah, I see that. Yeah. And I think the, there's two main areas I want to talk to you in regards to this topic. So one is Mm -hmm. dyslexia and the other is pragmatic uh, language and really like autism. I've seen really big differences in that regard, autism evaluations and services for pragmatic language, where some SLPs in schools will say, oh, yes, absolutely. We work on that. And like, we'll set goals and, and we'll work on pragmatic language and other SLPs are like, no, we don't do that here at school. I haven't seen that personally. Most of the SLPs that I work with, they are all about working on pragmatics or, you know, the social aspects of language. I have, I've never really ran across that, but I could see how there may be SLPs and maybe in the case where the child is receiving, you know, special education counseling, or um, they have a special ed teacher who's really helpful in those areas. Maybe that's why, because they the child is getting those reinforcements or a lot of times some of those pragmatic language issues can be addressed through accommodations like, you know, um, reminders to stay on task or, um, you know, just all those different things. So it really depends on each kid, but 
I, as an SLP, don't think I would ever say that personally, because it is a big right. part of language. And, you know, that has, you know, I talked about this earlier, the, the shift from training kids with autism on direct social skills. So basically what adults have said is that we're basically wanting them to behave socially to make the world more comfortable with them. And so the shift is we don't want a child to change who they are to make everyone else comfortable. We want the child to be able to be comfortable and communicate however they want and feel comfortable to. So that's a huge shift as well that some SLPs, yeah. you know, may not feel comfortable with. So, you know, my my theory on that is working on self-advocacy skills and all those kind of things with kids, which yeah. we can do as as speech pathologists. Right. Yeah, I've, I've definitely seen that um, happen, especially as kids are kind of growing out of their goals and meeting their goals, seeing SLPs switch the goal to more self advocacy before they like, right. you know, kind of just phasing them out, like you've met this now we just want you to self advocate. Um, on the social skills piece, I do think that mm -hmm. that has a lot of positives, like starting to look at it more that way. I, I think that there needs to be a middle ground still in terms of yes, we want to educate other people to be accepting and accommodating to people that are neurodivergent, but I think we still also simultaneously want to teach neurodivergent people and children about what other people maybe typically expect, not to say you have to do this, but just so they also understand the other side as well. And like they can choose what they're comfortable with trying to do or right. not trying to do. Yes, I think it would I be a disservice to just, you know, right. just do the other side. Yeah, so. no, I agree. I agree with that. I think, you know, a lot of kids that I've worked with, they want to know why, you know, maybe the kids aren't playing with them at recess. So we, we talk about it. So, and sometimes just being made aware of certain things, you know, it just gets them thinking and yeah, whether they want to adjust it or not, um, that's up to them. But yeah, I definitely, I agree with you on that. Also, my opinion on it would be to, you know, give children and teens the respect of answering those questions, right? And not just saying, oh, no, don't worry about it. Like they, other people need to adjust their behavior. It's like, oh, you know, this is why typically people, you know, like when you make eye contact, that's not to say that you have to do that, or we need to make maybe that a goal necessarily on your IEP. Um, right. But this is a skill that, you know, people typically like. And if you don't want to do that, that's fine. And like, we can find other ways to help you make friends and like, engage with people. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And especially for the eye contact, that used to be a huge goal. That, and now it's like, absolutely never put that in an IEP. Yeah. It's, it's just not a good goal. But yeah, but I like to explain like, why people make eye contact to and but if that's so uncomfortable for you that's okay you can right. try just facing your body towards the person so they know you're you know wanting to talk to them you know there's other things you can do and you just find, you just find the comfort level for each person and that's what i do you know i just really focus on the kid the specific kid because no two kids are you you know are the same yeah. as everyone knows no i completely agree and that's exactly what i was thinking as well I and mean, that's why it's called an iep an individualized education yeah. plan but even outside of special education, like every human is their own unique person and what works for one person may or may not work for the other neurodivergent autism, regardless of those things. Yes. And so I love that, you know, really just focusing on that specific child and having those open, honest, empathetic conversations with them to figure out what works best for them. And I think that that is why one of the hard pieces about being on social media, and maybe you've experienced this, is we're having to talk about topics, sensitive topics, really large, complicated topics on a national or even worldwide level in like these right. short clips. And so sometimes people might misunderstand what we mean or might take offense to something because they think that like saying one thing excludes like another. Sure. Yeah. But we're talking yeah. about it, you know, kind of on this large scale, we only have so much time to put in certain things into videos. Yeah, it know? is difficult when people, you know, project one thing you say on ever, you know, on a broad topic, but you know, you live and learn with social media and you, I just try not to let it bother me. But Yeah, yeah. And overall, what has been your experience like running Panda Speech? Is it been a positive one for you? How's your community? Do you, are you mostly followed by other SLPs or who's your audience usually? I think mostly SLPs. I have a lot of special education teachers. Um, I have a I have several school psychologists, school based professionals as well, or you know people who. Well, now that I have a, I'm a children's book author, I'm getting more and more parents or you know preschool teachers, stuff like that. And what would you say 
is your favorite part of being a speech language pathologist? Well, kind of like what we were talking about earlier, my favorite part is looking at one client or patient or student, whatever you want to call them, and really figuring out what we can do to help support them the most, whether that's through me or whether that's tr me training teachers, whatever it takes. And, and I think that's my favorite part because each kid is like, they have so many different things going on in their life. So, you know, they may have articulation errors, but they may also be struggling with self-esteem from the articulation errors. So we're also going to be supporting that area. Um, so, you know, it just really depends on each kid. And of course, I think, you know, this is to be expected. The least favorite would be all of the, the paperwork. And in schools, I never want to sound like I'm too good to do anything. But when I have time that I could be doing therapy and I'm pulled to do like other duties, that drives me crazy. Like, why, yeah. are, why am I having to have a giant group of five kids because you need me to go stand in the cafeteria for 30 minutes where I could have had, you know, a smaller group and made more progress with children. And so that's my probably my favorite thing about being a contract school therapist. I go in, I go out, I get my job done. I don't do anything extra. Right. Yeah. I don't think that it sounds like you think you're too good to do those things. There's a shortage of us as practitioners and right. there's usually only one, if there even is one, right? Because you're doing right. contract work because those schools don't even have enough. Um, right. There's one of us. Our caseloads are huge. I'm assuming for SLPs, you're, you guys are overworked too. You have large caseloads. Yep. We're trying to make progress for these kids and meet their IEP minutes and services. And so, yes, there are other staff members who probably could help with that or could be hired to help with that when we have like legal timelines to me and, you know, services to provide these kids. So I understand where you're coming from there. At least as a school psychologist, it's a safe space to say that. And I'm not misinterpreting your intentions with that. Well, you know, I, in my advocating talk that I do, people are always like, well, how, what can I do about it? There's uh, nothing I can do. I'm like, well, here's what I did. One year I was asked to do bus drop off every morning. So I would do it, but I wouldn't get back to my room till 8.10. My first speech therapy group started at 8. So I was missing. And so that put me all the way 10 minutes back the whole day. And I wasn't meeting all the kids minutes. I didn't have enough time. So I took my crazy schedule to the principal and said, hey, I'm having this difficulty. I'm missing half of these kids speech time. I don't know what to do because this is legal minutes we have to meet. I said, here's my schedule. Do you can you give me an idea? Because it's pretty packed. She looked at it and was like, I'm going to take you off bus duty. But on Friday mornings, I see you don't have an eight o'clock. Can you still do it on Friday? I was like, absolutely. That would be perfect. So it really just took me going to the administrator or whoever's in charge and advocating for my kids. And yeah. it worked. And I'm not saying it's always yeah. going to work. But if you never say anything, it definitely will never work. You know, that's a great point. And I think it goes back to most staff do not understand each other's roles and all the things we have to get done in a day. And so you have to learn to self advocate like in a respectful way. And yes. also like also with good intentions, because your principal probably once they saw that was like, Oh, shoot, sorry, Amanda, like, yeah, you're right, you do need to get those minutes done. And it's a big issue for the school if we don't get and the district if we don't get those minutes done. But I didn't realize because we usually work kind of isolated in our offices. Right. Um, they, they don't see our schedule. Everyone's doing their own thing. So learning to self-advocate is super important. I wish it was a, a little course in grad school for all of us on like, these are yes. the most common things you're probably going to have to advocate for and here are good ways to do it. Yes, yes. And well, and another weird thing that speech therapists face in schools is we off, often get subpar working environments, um, like storage closet rooms uh, or rooms with dividers and they'll have multiple, uh, like an OT and an SLP in one room, which is crazy to me because we work with highly confidential you know services but that's another area that I encourage SLPs to advocate for and I actually did a poll with speech therapist on if you don't have a regular classroom at a school please tell me where you're doing therapy and I'm not kidding I mean I had like concession stands under a stairwell in the parking lot and the best one was a greenhouse and oh she, my said, gosh. <laughs> she said she said one day we found a dead possum in the trash can. Um, and so they finally switched us. And so in my big talk, that was my big headline. It shouldn't take a dead possum. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And 
you know what? You sound like a school psychologist. I think if people aren't already besties with their SLP school sites and SLPs, this episode is going to make them realize they should be because that is a running joke amongst school psychologists too, is oh. oftentimes we don't have a confidential space like for good working conditions. And again, it goes back to, I think there is limited space in schools, but the people assigning those spaces don't often fully understand our jobs and why we need a space. Like, yes, it's great to have an office. Everyone wants an office. Everyone deserves an office. But the reason goes deeper than just, I want an office. Right. So, uh, you know, my friend, the school psychologist, you know, y'all, you have time tests where if you can't stop and start it. Those are times if you, someone interrupts, it messes up and it's invalid. So she would put, you know, a stop sign, you know, that you've seen, but she would actually have to tape it over the doorknob because people would ignore it, shake it, try to come in. And so... It always made me laugh when I was walking by her room to see it like over like this giant it's thing. It's crazy. Of- yeah. People, I've heard stories of people going to get the janitor or custodian to unlock the, the office door of the practitioner to get in. It's like, clearly there's a sign. It says like, do not come in. It's locked for a reason. Like some of the stuff that happens in schools is mind blowing and crazy. So yes, you got to get those do not disturb signs and make them yes. big and bold. It, You don't want to be rude, but you got to have it up there sometimes. I'm sure you get interrupted in session too. And like, there's a million different reasons why that is problematic in your work too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I have the stop sign and everything, but like I started from her example, putting it where um, like it Velcroed, but then it would flap down over the doorknob because I think people, they don't even look at your door signs. Like yeah. they literally, you literally have to stop their hand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I Different sites have said they've put it on the handle as well. That's mm-hmm. actually a really good idea. The flap down. I have a do not disturb sign that I sell and it's like a really big red stop sign. And when I put it up, I put it kind of like at eye level, like on the side where the handle would go. So that has helped me, but depending Hmm. on the school you're at, you might have to put it on the, on the door handle. Like some people just do not care and are just going to barge, try to barge in. (laughs) Yes. And that's another thing I tell people with, you know, you, we have a lot of documentation to do. So when you're in your room documenting, lock your door. Otherwise people are going to come in and want to chat, tell you school gossip, and then you waste so much time. Me and my friend, the school psychologist, we were really bad about that and we would end up having to take work home because we wasted time at work. I'm I'm not an advocate for taking work home, but if you waste time at work, then you better take it home. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, but it's hard. It is because you want a break, a mental break, and sometimes just to kind of like, you know, chat with a friend. But when I have time to do paperwork, I lock my door, I put the stop sign over, and I just don't answer. And if if it's urgent, they'll call on my phone, you know? Right. Or email you. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good tip. You know, I think another class that would have been helpful is like what boundaries you might need to set and how to set them. You feel rude doing that sometimes, but you know, you have to protect your time as well because protecting your time is actually in the end going to pay off to the students you're servicing because then you're going to have more time to work with them. It can feel especially like you have to report right to you have to test it can feel sometimes like oh well if you're not in a meeting you shouldn't be able to block off your timer but that is just as important a piece of our job as like sitting in a meeting I think sometimes if people see us in our office just like typing away they don't think we're busy but but we are and sometimes people come in just to chat and it's nice to have a break but also I'm sure you experience this too it's work they're coming in to talk to you about a student that they're concerned about or give you updates and that is important but you have to learn to set those boundaries so it's like okay yes email me we'll find a time to talk about this like right now I'm report writing or documenting services and it's a little bit much to have to explain that to everyone and they might not understand. So you, it's probably easier to just, like you said, lock your door, put up a sign that says email me or call me if there's an emergency, yeah. like I'm busy right now. I think this is a really important thing to talk about. One thing I hear a lot of times is, why is the SLP talking about dyslexia? Why am I hearing even like private SLPs diagnosing dyslexia? So can you tell me what is the training that SLPs have on dyslexia. It is a language-based disorder. I think as psychs, we're so trained in it that we forget that 
maybe other practitioners can look at it as well? Well, so like I said before, I'm not super trained in this. Um, it's not one of my areas of uh, competence, but it is, there's a lot of different, there's overlap with language and phonological processing and phonological awareness that, you know, that speech therapists uh, work on. So we work on sound manipulation in words. Um, that's, and that's an area in dyslexia that kids have a, a lot of difficulty with. I think that would be the main areas. So your phonology, phonological processing, um, and sound manipulation um, would be the biggest overlap. But also, I mean, kids with dyslexia also have comprehensive, sometimes can have the comprehension piece that it's because they are not being able to read fluently, they're not comprehending what they're reading. So speech therapists, we work with kids on strategies to help with those comprehension when they're having difficulty reading um, as well. So I probably am not the best SLP to interview with dyslexia, yeah, but that's okay. Well, and so I guess I was also wondering more in terms of the evaluation piece versus mm. the services. So okay. you guys, do you guys have evaluations that you use to look at dyslexia? Are you guys trained in that? I know it's been a while since you were in grad school. And I think dyslexia, <laughs> while it's not a new thing, it's newer in terms of like being at the forefront and the research that's like come out about it and the interest in it and the laws around it. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a uh, phonological test like the C-top we're trained to give. I'm sure you've given the C-top. That's a, a common All the one. Time. <laughs> I will never forget the, because, okay, for people who don't know, it works on different kind of phonological awareness and they have a, a made up word subtest and all those silly words, like all those, like, you know, the made up words. I hate like, giving I, that the, part. Yeah. <laughs> and those words just stick in my head. But anyways, and like the GORT, it's a reading test. Um, I've been trained to give the GORT. Um, and sometimes in a full battery, um, like a full eval team, I may give it or, you know, the Diag may give it. It just depends on that specific situation. We are trained in those two tests. And there's also, a, there's another one. I can't remember what it is, but it's really good with reading and um, dyslexia. There's Maybe a lot of them. Yeah, there are. There are. But <laughs> I think it's important for us to know that you are trained to give those assessments. That doesn't mean that you like necessarily in the school's would be giving those. I think typically if the concern is like SLD and there's not really other communication concerns, you're not typically involved in the evaluation. So we do typically give those markers of dyslexia, like evaluations and tests. Like we often give the CTOP. It's one of the most common ones for right. phonological processing. But I think it's important for us to know you're trained in that, not so that you go and say, oh, hey, SLP, like, go give this for me. Um, but just yeah. so that we understand each other a little bit better, because I think most psychs don't know that we're usually trained to think like we're the ones that are in charge of these evaluations. And so when we get even private reports from SLPs and we see that they gave that, we're like, why would an SLP give that? Like, they're not a psychologist. And I know that sounds kind of bad, but again, just being no. completely, yeah, you know, transparent for the audience to know, like SLPs can give those too. Right, right. You know, one, I don't know, in Texas, um, the Texas edu Education Agency, we had a lot of issues with um, dyslexia and whether it qualified for special education, like before... I can't remember how many years it, uh, it's been, but basically Texas was under fire for maybe possibly denying IEPs um, for kids who are dyslexic because it wasn't a disability, I mean, an eligibility criteria. But now in Texas, it, it, it can go under specific learning disability, but before yeah. it did not. So when that happened, we had a lot of kids who were in our uh, gen ed, um, like uh, um, what do they call it, like reading recovery, dyslexia mm -hmm, services. Mm -hmm who pop, probably some of those needed IEPs, not all of them. So we had to do a ton of testing that year. And I can't remember what year it was, but I actually helped the dyslexia specialist and the school site give the CTOP because we had a lot to do. So we all kind of teamed yeah. up to, to get those, to see if there were kids who actually needed the IEPs. I mean, of course, there was a lot of other factors going in all that, but that's in Texas, dyslexia has been a huge focus. Um, and so really it is, you know, very important that as any school professional, you know, working in our, in our field or with kids, you should have some background knowledge of it. Yeah, I think dyslexia is huge, really nationally, like in okay. every state. And as psychologists, there's even some, I don't know if confusion's the right 
word, but like differing opinions and maybe based off of like how long ago you were trained or what your training told you. But most school psychologists nowadays should know and should be stating that dyslexia is a learning disability and it falls, right. it's under the umbrella of learning disability and it's under the umbrella of a reading learning disability. Right. So right. while as school psychologists, we're trained to say we don't diagnose in schools because we don't give medical diagnoses at schools, we are able to identify dyslexia because it's a learning disability. I think the only thing that maybe is causing the confusion when we see the CTOP or phonological processing given by other providers and then diagnosing dyslexia is the difference in how we were trained in identifying it because we have mm -hmm. different models we use to say if it's actually meeting the criteria for dyslexia. So it's not just the issue with phonological processing, but it's in relation to then their reading abilities and their right. cognitive abilities, usually. That's but there's different methods. I wish grad schools did more training, like with us all working together, especially SLPs right. and school sites, because we do have some overlaps. And that's something good for people to know too, is if you and the SLP are doing an evaluation at the same time, you guys should talk to make sure you're not giving the same tests and like that right. your data can work nicely together. Yeah, absolutely. And especially with autism evaluations, we gave the ADOS a lot. And I was trained, I was actually sent to, like, I think it was Denver to get trained in this. And, um, or somewhere, I can, maybe it's Pennsylvania, I went far to get trained in the ADOS. And, you know, in the training, it says you need a the person um, interacting with the child, and then you need someone observing and taking notes. And that's a requirement for the test. Do you know how many times I will get reports where only one person did the ADOS? I'm like, yeah. no. But I mean, I don't know what the minimum requirements is, but the best practice is two people. So me and the, uh, my school psych, we always did them together, which was so great because we had the psychologist perspective and then the, you know, the speech and language perspective during the test. And then we would score and interpret and do all of it together. And it was so nice. That's amazing because autism is one of those eligibility categories for special education where like the two main pieces really are language and social skills. It's so like the psychologist and SLP, what better way to work together? Right, exactly. Exactly. You know, in me and my school, it's like we all in we had an LPC counselor, we ran groups for kids. Um, they were kind of like social skills groups. We did a lot of stuff for like self advocating, communicating your needs, but we did social skills stuff too. But it was like a really cool group because we had three professionals with three unique perspectives. And that was a fun that program lasted for about two years. And it was really neat. So that was another way I collaborated with my school psych. Yeah, I'm sure we could talk forever about all the different ways we could collaborate. Yeah. Um, but I think it's really fun that we're able to do that. I wanted to before we go, I wanted to ask you a little bit about parenting and being an SLP. Um, I know that's something that people are really interested in with like how being a mom influences your work as a school based practitioner and vice versa, like how being a speech language pathologist may have impacted like how you raised your kids or how you interacted with them? Well, I mean, there's so many things. Um, but yeah. you know, one, of the, one of the main things I think is, you know, I had some of my children when my own children had different therapies. And so I got to be the, mo uh, be the mom, you know, running around like crazy, trying to get their kids to appointments and all that. And sometimes moms just need a little bit of grace. You know, um, if we don't, you know, if a mom doesn't show up to the meeting, you know, a lot of people will say, I can't believe this mom didn't show up to the meeting. But you, you never know what's going on in their life. They're, you know, their younger child could have had a meltdown or, you know, whatever. And there's just so many dynamics. And being a mom and having all those moments where sometimes I was late or couldn't make a meeting or, you know, do something like that. That just made me think there's so many factors. And so don't judge parents, give them grace. Um, the other thing with like being a speech pathologist is language development. Um, you know, knowing what's typical and what's not typical. Um, Cause I had two sons who they talked pretty typical, like, you know, that just the normal milestones were met. And then I had one who didn't. I was actually in grad school when they were little tinies, but I was learning it as I went. And I was like, okay, I think I need to get one of my children evaluated, mm -hmm, you know, cause they're not, mm -hmm. they're not. So that's been helpful. And then as a speech pathologist, I think it has helped me being a mom because I understand that every kid is unique. And I don't treat all of my kids the same. I give them exactly what they need for their unique little brains and their emotions and their feelings. And I don't know if I would have understood that to the point 
um, if I wasn't a speech pathologist and working with kids, uh, you know, neurodivergent kids, you know, neurotypical kids and all the different kids I've worked with. It just made me really, you know, conscious that each kid needs different stuff. You know, you can't just have a blanket way of raising a kid. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think especially because you've had more than one kid, you've seen that on an even deeper level. Like, you know, that from working with all these different kids, school based mm -hmm. or not, and just working with different people, but you've gotten to see how you said you have three different kids, right? How like all mm -hmm. three of them have developed in their own unique ways. And yeah, you know, every case one, is different. Right. You know, one thing is funny. I have two, my two older ones, they're super like, they're very smart. Like, one of them's genius level, one is close to genius level. Like they took SATs at seventh grade and passed at a oh college level. <laughs> they were in this Duke pro program anyways. So they're just, and they, like, I feel like they went to kindergarten and then they came home and they just could read. Like I didn't, I don't, I just had to, I didn't do anything. They knew their sight words. It's like, they just picked it up, absorbed it. And then my youngest, he progressed through school on an average range. But to us having these two higher level and one of them is twice exceptional. We thought our youngest one, there was something wrong or, you know, maybe right, he was right. having difficulty learning, but really he was just learning average and that's okay. You know, that's okay. But it was so weird coming from the two older ones in kindergarten, just picking it up with no effort. But we really had to work with our younger one on reading and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I just remember, you know, my older kids with the sight words, they just got them. And my younger one, he always would try to sound them out. And I'd be like, honey, no, we don't sound out these words. These are our, our brain words. We got to know them. And right. so he would always try to sound out the, like he, oh. uh, I'm like, no, honey. Yeah, it's never gonna work. Yeah, but I, I didn't. I didn't have to do that with my older ones. So even you know within one family, the the differences. And I think that's a really good point. Uh, the psychologist in me is coming out here, but like the conversation between nature and nurture, and I think it's so important for parents to realize like it really is both. So like, if you right. only had, you know, your one kid who everything came super easy, you think, oh, it's because of everything I did as a mom, like I did everything right. Like I, this, and you know, preaching to the, to everyone, like, no, this is what you have to do to get your kid to be a genius and read easily. <laughs> and it's like, yes, there are things you can do definitely that help and like help bring out those characteristics and support them. Um, but also like there is a part of nature and like your right. kid is their own person. They're born a certain way and you can either deprive them of things that will help them or you can help them flourish even more or provide interventions when they're needed to help right. like alleviate some of those challenges. Um, absolutely. And so I think that's important for parents to know too. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, you know, I will say parents, the you know, they always say, what's your biggest tip for like, you know, kids who may have speech difficulties? And honestly, and I mean this, read to them every day, read to them. You know, if they are too young and they won't attend to the book, do a picture story of the pictures on the pages, point to words, you know, just reading is such a powerful thing for language development. There's so many things that can come from children's books, um, perspectives, the, you know, the lessons and all that stuff. Ask questions about stories. Those are the things that I always tell parents. And sometimes, you know, to be honest, that's the one of the hardest thing for parents, especially parents who work multiple jobs or work in the evenings, is they just don't have the time to do it. Um, but I always say, even if it's five minutes a day, just expose them to that language. They need to hear those words, you know, all those things. So yeah, isn't there, I forget what it's called, but the amount of words you're exposed to as a kid, like can kind of predict like your reading challenges when you're a little bit older. Um, and yes. like children who grow up in households who are spoken to all the time and are read to a lot, like have an advantage over kids who didn't get that, regardless kind of of their natural abilities that they were born with. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I can't remember the number. I, w I want to say it's like 300,000 or, you know, or it's some it's kids. It's something big. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're, I've read that, that, that article or that piece. So yeah, but it, it's it's true. It's huge. And, you know, that's one thing. My husband, he would read novels to the kids when they were little. He'd put them to bed and would read full novels, like, you know, a chapter a night to them. Yeah, they're not understanding all of it when they're that little or, you know, they may not be picking up on all the vocabulary, but they're just being exposed. They're hearing those words. Um, and of course, we did the, you know, we read picture books and, and kid books with them. And then every night, once they got school aged, we had them read to us, we read to them. And and it's really a special time. I, I mean, I, I would give anything in the world to go back to those times. I have, you know, big kids, so 
it's, yeah. it is, it's a nice, it's also great for bonding and just, you know, but I know not all family, and that's another thing from my social work side, not all families have the luxury of getting the time to do that because of different issues. So just be understanding and that some kids who may not, may not have gotten read to, um, they may need some more support at school from the staff and, and that's okay. It's, um, and that's our job. You know, my niece and nephew, my sister had them twins, a boy and girl at 16. Their lives were a little crazy, but you know, all of the, our family had to intervene, but my sister wasn't, wasn't in a space to read to them every single night. And, and so they do have more challenges than let's say my kids who got that. And so I've seen that kind of firsthand just within, within my own family. And I think it's a combination of, you know, there's some families that don't have the time to do that. There's also families that don't have the education to know to do that. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's totally understandable why a parent might think like, well, why, why do I need to read to my kid all the time? Like they don't, or my baby, you know, like they don't understand what I'm saying. Why do I need to talk to them and, you know, say everything that I'm doing so that they're hearing this language? They don't understand. They can't talk back. Um, I think social media is really helping a lot with that. Like there's pros and cons to social media. One of the pros I think is I do see a lot of speech language pathologists and therapists like advocating to parents to talk to your baby, like, explain everything you're doing, ask them questions, like read to them. And there's a lot of young people on social media. So I think that from an early age now, parents are seeing that like, that's something that is not weird and like actually can be helpful to do with your kids. Yeah, absolutely. I love the, I have several uh, friends on social media who are early interventionists and they That's all their account is, is giving those tips and advice for parents. You know, I had a parent, I was evaluating a two-year-old one, this is years ago. And I was like, where's your nose? Where's your tummy? And the child didn't know. And the mom interrupted my evaluation and she, in panic, she goes, was I supposed to teach her that? I didn't know. And I'm like, oh, well, it's okay. You know, and so then I got to, you know, tell parents, you know, educate this mom on like, you know, identifying body parts, talking about sho- their clothing items and all those kind of things. And so, but she, you know, and it's some, like you said, sometimes people just don't, you know, think about it. it well, it, like it was you said, eye-opener. giving grace, giving grace to yes. parents, um, like regardless of the background that they come from, like we are trained in this. So we it it starts to feel like common sense to us. So then when you see a parent who like doesn't show up to a meeting or doesn't understand something or didn't do something with their kid, you think, oh, why wouldn't they have done that? It's like, well, they just didn't know, like benefit of the doubt. And like, you know, let's help to train them on like what we can do. And, And that's the amazing thing about early intervention too and advocating for those services is it's not a lost cause just because it wasn't done. Like there's still so much that can be done. And that will be done. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on. I know we've been talking for quite a while, so I'm going to let us wrap this up because I could ask you a million questions, but it was wonderful talking with you. Yeah, it was fun. I'm like I said, I I love school psychologists. Um, You guys are a wealth of knowledge and I, I miss not having my friend next door because I was always, you know, banging on her door asking her stuff about, you know, y'all's job. Yeah. I know I'm not in the schools this year. I'm staying home with my son and I, I love it. I'm so grateful for it, but I also do miss some of those connections and like getting to service kids. Yeah. Where can people find you if they want to reach out to you or buy your book or other resources that you have? Panda speech. It's just at Panda speech, the animal, you know, and then the word speech. I have a website, pandaspeech.com. I sell all my books on my website. And then I also post a ton of stuff on social media. I share tips mainly for educators and speech pathologists, but I also share boundary setting tips and advocate self advocation tips. So any person working in any environment really can, can get something out of it. So and if someone wants to find your book, shoppandaspeech.com is the quick way to get to it. But if you go to my main website, there's a link for it. And then coming in a month, I am also publishing three joke books for kids that um, have the pictures, the punchline and the question on separate pages. And then I break down the, the literary and vocabulary concepts in each joke, whether it's an idiom, personification, synonym, antonym, to make learning an educational tool. I mean, the jokes, the educational tool. Yeah. So I'm really excited about those. Those will be on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, hopefully by next month. But I'll have everything on my website if anyone is interested in that. <laughs> Super excited. I can't wait to see them. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Amanda.